Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to the second informational webinar for Evidence for Action, Investigator-Initiated Research to Build a Culture of Health. Evidence for Action is a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation based at the Center for Health and Community at the University of California, San Francisco. I am Erin Hagan, the Deputy Director for Evidence for Action, and I will be your moderator today. During the webinar, our speakers will provide an overview of the program, describe the calls for proposals, including the grant application process, and answer questions from the audience. We've already received some questions from participants through the registration process, and throughout the webinar, please send questions through the chat feature as they arise. We'll address as many as possible at the end of the presentation. We have a lot to cover today, so let's get right into it. I'd like to start by asking each of the speakers to introduce themselves, starting with our program officer at the Fa Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Thank you. This is Tracy Costigan, Senior Program Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Hi, and this is Nancy Adler, uh, Co-Director of the Evidence for Action Program. And this is David Baha, and I'm also Evidence for Action Co-Director. And Laura Gottlieb, Evidence for Action Associate Director. Great. Thank you all. So Tracy, why don't you start by giving everyone a bit of a background about the Foundation's Culture of Health vision. Thanks, Erin. A culture of health represents the belief that everyone, regardless of their ethnic, racial, geographic, or socioeconomic circumstances, should have the means and the opportunity to lead the healthiest lives they can. Achieving a culture of health requires us to broaden the understanding that good health is far more than the absence of illness. Where we work, where we live, what we eat, and where our children play and go to school fundamentally affects our ability to lead healthy lives. So looking ahead, the Foundation's focus on building a culture of health means that we, catal we are catalyzing a larger national movement towards a real societal transformation, a chance to eliminate health disparities caused by social, environmental, and economic factors, and a powerful way to improve and advance public health. This is a big challenge for all of us, but there are significant pockets of progress around the country where a diverse range of activities is already driving such transformation. One such activity is represented by the Foundation's large investment in research, research that promotes progress in improving the health and well-being of our diverse populations. Next slide, please. Thank you. Our vision of a culture of health is represented in this framework in which there are four primary action areas that will drive us to our vision of building a culture of health, which is represented by the outcome, improved population health and well-being at its center. It's our hope that these action areas will spark a productive national conversation about what influences health. We also hope the action areas will kindle a greater sense of both individual and shared accountability and inspire different sectors to work together to improve outcomes and raise America's health to the level a great nation deserves. We're also seeking research to connect these action areas to the intended outcomes. A bit about the action areas. The first one, making health a shared value, is measured by indicators such as the percentage of people who strongly agree that health is influenced by their peers and their communities, and the percentage who indicate that they have adequate social support from family and friends. The second action area, fostering cross-sector collaboration to improve well-being, is denoted by measures like the number of local health departments that collaborate with community organizations and employers who promote better health in the workplace. Third, creating healthier, more equitable communities um, is represented by measurements such as the number of grocery stores, farmers markets, and safe sidewalks in communities, the ratio of children attending preschool, and the affordability of housing. In the fourth action area, strengthening integration of health services and systems is gauged by measures such as the percentage of people served by a comprehensive public health system and the percentage of physicians sharing electronic data with other clinicians, health systems, and patients. It's important to note that to improve the health and prosperity of our entire nation, we must eliminate health disparities, which are often tied to economic and social factors. Personal choice and responsibility play a key role in attaining it, attaining and maintaining health. However, the choices people make depend on the choices they have. We seek research to identify and strengthen evidence-based solutions that expand equal opportunity for health for everyone in the United States. 
As such, the concept of achieving health equity is infused throughout the model and critical to the outcome of improved population health and well-being. It is central to building a culture of health and not meant as a side note. Rather, we are calling it out specifically by giving its own place in the model. Next slide. Great. Thank you so much, Tracy. That's such helpful context for this work. Now I'd like to ask Nancy to describe how the Evidence for Action program will help support the foundation in building a culture of health. Thank you. As a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Evidence for Action is tasked with developing the evidence base needed to build a national culture of health. First and foremost, we want to stress that this is a research program. We will award grants to support innovative, rigorous research to address gaps in knowledge about the impact of programs, policies, and partnerships on health and well-being with a particular focus on advancing health equity. It's critical that applicants include a clear description of their research questions and approach when applying for a grant. We're also interested in exploring novel approaches to measuring health determinants and outcomes, so it is appropriate to propose the development of new research tools or instruments. This is an investigator-initiated program. This means we have not defined specific research questions to be addressed. We're really looking to the field to generate ideas about the most pressing, timely, and important research. The research that we hope to fund through the Evidence for Action will better explain the underlying constructs of the components of the action framework that Tracy described, as well as the interactions among the action areas and how they affect health. The action framework is visionary, and it helps to pinpoint areas where empirical validation is needed. Many questions still remain about the critical components, how they work to improve health and well-being, and how they can be modified. Building a culture of health will require understanding how non-health programs and policies affect health outcomes. We know many relevant policies and programs cross different sectors, and we strongly encourage applications from multi-sector research teams. So our overall aim is that the research results that are generated through the program will help guide effective actions to improve population health and health equity. Thanks so much, Nancy. Let me take a minute to go over some of the high-level details about our grants. So the program is initially authorized for $6.6 .6 million over three years. So that's about $2.2 million per year. This is a rolling program, and so um, the year-to-year the -year time frame is less applicable as in other programs. So it's a little over $6.5 million for the three years. We're not setting a specific dollar amount per grant, but we expect to award somewhere between five to 12 grants per year. And we expect to have a research portfolio that includes studies of various sizes and costs. In evaluating the applications, we will really focus on the importance and quality of the proposed project. So the budget will be secondary to the LOI phase, and we trust that applicants will ask for what is realistically needed to accomplish the proposed research. Given our limited funds, we will need to factor in the opportunity cost of funding larger projects in relation to those with smaller budgets. The grant periods will likely vary, but we plan on no more than 30-month periods at this time. In the application process, we'll ask researchers to tell us how long they need to conduct their proposed study. The applicant eligibility is really pretty straightforward. Applicants must be U.S.-based public entities or nonprofit organizations that are tax-exempt under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code and not a private foundation or a Type 3 supporting organization. This is not just a program for researchers in the health field. We encourage investigators and teams from a variety of sectors and disciplines to apply, and we're really hoping to get applications from cross-sector research teams that include business leaders, community planning experts, architects, economic development professionals, policy advocates, 
people in the asset building sector or people with experience in criminal justice. The, the list could really go on for quite a while. We also hope that community-based organizations and advocacy groups will reach out to academic or professional researchers as partners in this work. As we've mentioned, we're leaving much of this program up to the researchers, from the specific research questions to the funding amount and the duration, but we do have some general ideas about the research that might best support the Foundation's vision of building a culture of health. So we'd like to spend the next few minutes going over the themes and approaches that are included in the CFP. Um, and I'd like to turn to Nancy to ask you to tee up the conversation by describing the purpose of the themes and how we arrived at them. Great. I'm happy to do that. Uh, let me start by stressing that the themes are provided as a general guidance to provide context for the work. These are not categories uh, in terms of requirements for funding, and researchers do not need to designate a specific theme when applying for funding. In the early stages of launching the program, what we did was to convene a, a working group of researchers in the Bay Area who represented diverse disciplines to help us think about how best to define a culture of health and to identify some of the areas where empirical evidence is most needed to advance it. Out of these meetings, we, developed, we basically derived some thematic areas and uh, further refined those through conversations with staff at the foundation and our internal team. So there are six themes uh, uh, or thematic areas that are described in the call for proposals. That's, these are advancing health equity, conditions and programs that foster a culture of health in communities, creating healthy trajectories across the life course, health system activities that foster a culture of health, measures of the components of the action framework, multi-sector partnerships, and trade-offs and unintended consequences. And uh, David and Laura will describe each of these themes now in more detail. Thanks, Nancy. So David and Laura, we'll turn it over to you to walk us through the themes. David, can you get us started? Okay. So I'll start us off with the theme about advancing health equity. Equity is an overarching component of the entire action framework and should be considered in all domains. The association between social and environmental factors and poorer health outcomes among low-income people and people of color is well established. Why this pattern occurs and how it can be changed are questions we're still trying to answer. In addition to considering equity as a component of all studies, we encourage applicants to propose studies that specifically address social and economic inequities and their, in, excuse me, their impact on health outcomes, not just to demonstrate inequities, but to discover the best ways to reduce and eliminate them. Examples of relevant research topics might include determining differential uptake or impact of healthy living strategies across social, economic, geographic, racial, or cultural areas or groups, or identifying the most successful techniques and approaches for expanding opportunities for people living in disadvantaged areas. Shifting now to the theme about conditions and programs that foster a culture of health in communities, we know community characteristics can promote or impede good health and well-being. But research is still needed to better understand what characteristics have the greatest impact and how policies and practices can be formulated and implemented to shape equitable and healthy communities. This could this could include research on the processes by which decisions that impact the culture of health are made, how evidence can best be translated and disseminated in a manner that can inform policy decisions, differences or similarities in program implementation and outcomes across multiple settings, or linking measures of civic engagement and social cohesion with health outcomes among diverse populations. Laura? 
Thanks, David. So this theme, Creating Healthy Trajectories Across the Life Course, is based on research suggesting that there may be sensitive or critical periods during which additional resources or supports have disproportionately large health benefits. But there's still quite a bit of uncertainty about these sensitive periods, if and when they occur, whether they're best defined based on biological age or major life events or some other criterion, and what determines how a person will respond to stressors, events, or interventions encountered during these periods. In addition to further exploration of these questions, other relevant research areas might include creative strategies to align the needs of individuals at different points in the life course, so the same policies benefit all groups, or how to provide useful evidence to help policymakers balance investments with different payoffs over time. This theme on health system activities that foster a culture of health is related to the roles and, and activities that healthcare systems will need to take on to contribute to building a culture of health. We're specifically interested in how these new roles can help integrate the healthcare system with other sectors to improve health and well-being. This theme includes healthcare system activities focused on value, access, and cost as well as those that increase the capacity of healthcare providers to work effectively across delivery systems, to share data to improve population health, and to bridge healthcare with social care sectors. There's a need to more rigorously study the connections between interventions in healthcare settings that target upstream determinants and individual and community health outcomes, and to evaluate these interventions using metrics for return on investment that could support scaling successful strategies. Some examples of research included under this theme include evaluating projects in which healthcare systems link patients with services that address social and behavioral determinants of health, like prescriptions for housing or food, evaluating the health impacts of actual healthcare system investments in upstream interventions, such as supportive housing or on-site food distribution programs, or comparing both approaches to and impacts of community benefits, needs assessments, and other community benefits investments. In addition to our traditional models and methods, new measures and metrics are also needed to better understand and track the ideas represented in the Culture of Health Action Framework. This theme on measures of components of the action framework addresses the need to both develop these measures and adopt innovative research approaches to analyze the components of the framework, the links between these components and the measures of population health and equity. Areas of research in this theme could include research to, better, to develop better indicators of population health that are appropriate across the life course and that capture a broad view of physical and mental health and well-being. The development of more robust indicators of effective partnerships between health systems and public health. Validation of measures of key community characteristics that foster a culture of health. Or empirical tests to evaluate whether and how the components of the action framework influence population health and well-being. David? Yeah, so now we're going to talk about multi-sector partnerships. And this theme highlights research on partnerships that are most likely to bring together diverse stakeholders to work in collaboration to invest and improve population health. These stakeholders could represent housing, transportation, environment, commerce, education, or other sectors. We hope that research under this theme will provide empirical validation for the impacts of multi-sector partnerships on individual and population health outcomes. Aspects of partnerships that could be studied include data systems that improve the continuity of care across diverse systems, defined management structures, and community participation and engagement. Research relevant to this theme could include evaluations of the health outcomes of care collaboratives that pool data across multiple agencies like accountable care communities, as well as the uses and implications of community health needs assessments that are developed through partnerships between healthcare systems and community organizations. 
Another area here is uh, trade-offs and unintended consequences. This recognizes that decision makers at all levels have to make choices and set priorities when allocating resources, and that these decisions may have disproportionately positive or negative outcomes for some groups compared to others. The interconnections between resources and health outcomes is complex, and we need better data on the cost and consequences related to the potential range of outcomes in order to more effectively anticipate the impacts of decisions across all areas of the action model. For example, research might involve incorporating assessment of health impacts into the evaluation of policy implementation in non-health sectors, such as housing, transportation, or education quantifying the benefits and the opportunity costs of prioritizing health versus some other outcome, or of targeting individuals at immediate risk versus the whole population, or identifying when progress towards improving one health outcome might alter or offset progress towards another. Erin? Thank you, David and Laura. That was a great overview and has hopefully gotten our participants thinking about interesting research ideas. I do want to reiterate that applicants are not required to align their proposals with any of these themes. We only provide them as a way to stimulate your thinking. I also want to remind people to continue submitting your questions through the chat feature and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. But before we turn to those questions, let's go over the process and criteria we'll use for awarding grants. This will be a two-phased process consisting of a two-page letter of intent followed by an invited full proposal. You will use the RWJF application system for submitting both LOIs and full proposals. In addition to the narrative of your letter or full proposal, the system will require you to provide other information such as tax verification, contact information, responses to supplemental questions, etc. You must complete all required sections of the application system in order for your submission to be accepted. Before I go on to this example timeline, I just want to stress that there is no deadline. You'll note that all, many of these dates are actually in the past at this point, so this example timeline was put together only to give people a general idea of the time they might expect to elapse between submission and uh, receiving status updates on their letter of intent. So we began accepting letters of intent on June 1st. We'll continue accepting them on a rolling basis throughout the life of the program. Those applicants that are invited to submit full proposals will have two months from the time they are notified to submit their proposal. And we anticipate awarding our first grants sometime in December. We hope that the that the example timeline, again, just gives you a sense of the timing between submission and receiving notice on your letter of intent or on your full proposal. Again, to stress, these dates do not represent any official timelines. Nancy, why don't I turn it over to you to review the selection criteria we'll use to evaluate the letters of intent and full proposals. Okay, and actually, and I will stress along with you that, uh, again, that the letters of intent may be submitted at any time. And when we get the letters of intent, they are evaluated internally by our team at the National Program Office on the basis of the fit with the Foundation's vision for building a culture of health, the importance of the scientific contribution of the study, and the feasibility of conducting the proposed research within the parameters of this program. It's critical to us in evaluating the letters of intent that we have a clear description of the research qu question. And uh, they, the research questions need to be carefully delineated in the letter of intent. In writing a letter of intent, we re recommend that applicants limit the description of the problem and its significance and focus primarily on describing the research approach and the potential actionable outcomes. The uh, final de the decisions about whether to invite a full proposal will be made collaboratively between the NPO and our program team 
at the foundation. Then when we get to the uh, full proposals, uh, the full proposals will undergo a more in-depth evaluation by both internal and external reviewers. We will select external reviewers based on the expertise related to the content of the proposal. And in addition to the criteria used to assess the letters of intent, full proposal evaluation criteria will also include the potential to address knowledge gaps and contribute to scientific advancement, the clarity and importance of the research aims and hypothesis, theoretical framework, conceptual model or rationale, the rigor and innovation of the design and the approach for sampling, data collection, and analysis, the uh, evidence of access to needed data, settings, and study populations, the specificity and appropriateness of data collection and data analysis, and the research qualifications, experience, accomplishments of the proposed team, the appropriateness of the disciplines and perspectives represented, and the commitment of the investigators to the project. We'll also look at the relevance of the study population, the plan for communicating and disseminating the research results, and the appropriateness of the timeline and budget. Thank you, Nancy. It's been about a month and a half since we released our first calls, call for proposals, and we've all, already received quite a few letters of intent. So based on what we've learned so far, we want to share some general guidance for writing a competitive letter of intent. As Nancy mentioned, applicants should focus the majority of their letter on outlining the research approach, including describing the research questions or hypotheses, the design, methodology, population, etc. There is an LOI template in the application system, and it includes specific guidelines about the information that should be addressed in your letter. So I encourage applicants to read those instructions carefully. You don't need to spend a lot of time making the case for why your work falls within our definition of a culture of health or aligning your research with one of the themes or action areas. The definition is quite broad, and as we mentioned previously, the themes are there purely for guidance and to, to stimulate your thinking. Ultimately, your LOI really needs to answer the questions, how and so what? How will you conduct your study and what course of action will be informed and broader health improvements achieved as a result of your research? Nancy, do you have any final thoughts or takeaways before we start answering questions? Now, let me just emphasize and reemphasize a couple of points. Uh, one is this is first and foremost a research program. We are not looking to fund program implementation unless it's in the context of an evaluation that will provide generalizable knowledge. And it is truly investigator initiated. We, we have no hidden agendas about topics or themes that we want to fund. We also have a very broad definition of culture of health. As long as your study is assessing health outcomes in some ways, it is likely to be relevant. But we do want to know what health outcomes you will be likely to be targeted. Uh, this, this point about assessing health outcomes really is critical. We want to understand whether and how changes in programs, policies, behaviors, et cetera, are linked to changes in health outcomes. We're hoping to get creative ideas regarding the important questions and that these will be addressed using rigorous methods that can yield informative results. And finally, I think I should add that we're new at this and we expect to learn a lot from our applicants and our grantees. It's really, uh, for us, a, a work in progress, and we may uh, make some modifications as we go along. Great. Thank you. Those are all critical points that I hope our webinar takes away, our, our, app, our applicants and participants take away from the webinar. This does conclude our formal presentation about the program and call for proposals, and we've had a lot of questions coming in from participants already. So let's just get right to them. The first question is, you indicated this program specifically targets funding research. Yes, we did indicate that many times. And program or policy implementation is not eligible. So is evaluation of the implementation of a program or policy considered research? Nancy, do you want to elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Uh, 
Uh, the answer is evaluation of a, a program or policy can be research, but it depends on how well framed it is and how how uh, rigorous and generalizable the findings will be. So the research needs to really be a rigorous evaluation. It needs to go beyond a simple pre-post questionnaire. And uh, the majority of the funding must be dedicated to the research-related activities, not to the, the program uh, itself. And uh, finally, we would want to know how generalizable it would be to a large enough population that it would actually move the needle on population health. Great. I think that's, that's a helpful clarification. The next question is uh, relatively nuanced, so I'll just go ahead and respond. The question is, how should we incorporate citations into a letter of intent, and will citations count against the two-page limit? So citations are not required at the letter of intent stage, and if you do choose to incorporate them, they will count towards your two-page limit for a letter of intent. The next question, David, I'll, I'll ask you to respond. It's how can I determine if my area of research is relevant or responsive to this call for proposals? Well, the call for proposals is uh, about the culture of health. And the definition of the culture of health is really quite broad. So as long as your research incorporates an assessment of health outcomes, it's likely to be relevant. Now, in writing your LOI, you should not spend too much time making the case for why your work is relevant to the culture of health action framework or specific themes from the call for proposals. Applicants should limit their description of the problem and its significance and focus instead primarily on describing the research approach and actionable outcomes. Emphasize the components of the research project such as research questions or hypothesis, methodology, design, study population, and how results of the research can be used to improve population health or health equity. Applicants may also uh, request brief conversations with our deputy director, Aaron, to confirm eligibility of a project prior to submitting an LOI. Great. So our next question, Tracy, I'll ask you to respond to. It says, my research looks at a very specific health issue in a very specific population. Are you interested in proposals for research projects that are narrowly focused in this way? Sure. So data, evidence, or metrics developed under this program should be action-oriented and scalable or broadly applicable to improving population health or health equity. We will consider studies focused more narrowly on specific outcomes on populations or settings, depending on the extent to which that research can also inform these broader goals. Thanks. So the next question is about the budget cap. So Laura, maybe you can take a stab at this one. It says, you, should, you said we should set a budget request based on what we need to conduct the study we are proposing. However, can we realistically assume there is some maximum award that would be made, say half a million? Sure. So we don't have a funding cap for individual projects. And the amount of funding you ask for should not influence our, our decision uh, regarding your letter of intent or the full proposal. The budget request that you submit should really incorporate all appropriate aspects of the project for the entire proposed duration of your project. Um, your team should request whatever amount is needed to accomplish the tasks that you describe in your research plan. And we are not planning to turn away a strong or an innovative research proposal that's you know, just based on the amount of funding that's requested, though we may discuss the request with, with you um, before, before we request a full proposal uh, if, yeah, if we do, do extend that invitation um, and, and if we're concerned about the requested amount of funding. Thanks. Nancy, the next question you are probably best situated to answer, it says you indicated evidence needs to be tied to health outcomes. Can you describe or give examples of the types of measures of health you would consider appropriate? Are you just interested in biomarkers or BMI or blood pressure, for example? Sure. Yeah. Uh, no, we're not just interested in biomarkers or uh, BMI. And actually, uh, we'd want to be sure that 
uh, people are thinking more broadly about population health, you know, what, one of the problems is we do not have good summative measures to capture the overall health of, of populations, and that, that's one of the areas where we're looking for creative work. We would certainly consider measures of well-being, including mental health status, and um, you know, also measures of intermediate factors that you know, are just so well established that they're linked to population health that we would consider we would know that they would have an impact on population health. So even things like health behaviors that we know that are linked to uh, health outcomes. Uh, so you know, smoking rates, for example, are, are clearly indicative of what the health of the population will uh, look like. So we're we're interested in proposals that will develop new measures and uh, some of the concepts we think may be linked to improved health, like shared values or social cohesion, and then looking at how improvements in those areas lead to improved health outcomes. But we, uh, what we do want, though, are you know, as rigorous as possible to have whatever measures of health outcomes are being used to be clearly defined and uh, a good description of how they'll be measured. Great. Thank you. So, Laura, another question for you to think about is what should the scope of work be? Organizational level, community level, national level, do we have a preference? Uh, so the answer to this is that we're really not envisioning a should. Um, any level, uh, whether organizational, community, or national, um, is appropriate. Um, depending on, on what the proposal is. So if the, yeah, if the appropriate target is a national level research and the research plan uh, fits that, then that's an, that's an appropriate proposal. Great. Thank you. Tracy, uh, another question that we've gotten is, are there specific areas within, the, uh, within health that evidence for action is prioritizing? Um, and people were asking for some, some specific examples. I think we've talked about some of the examples during the uh, webinar, but um, if you can just provide a bit of an overview around if there's any sort of specificity and how broad we are thinking around uh, research that we're interested in. Sure. Well, as we've tried to emphasize in this webinar and in the CFP, um, building a culture of health is very broad. And, um, <clears throat> and the themes that are presented in the CFP and in this webinar with some examples give you a sense of the, some of the things we're thinking about. But again, there are not specific areas. This really is investigator-initiated. We're looking for your ideas and innovations. Um, Based on how you know, based on your understanding and interpretation of building a culture of health. Um, certainly, if you go to the website evidenceforaction.org as well as to rwjf.org, you'll learn a lot more about culture of health and the various themes that we're looking at. Great, thank you. So, David, one of the questions we've gotten is around the specifications for a for a primary investigator. So. What are they? Um, are there particular degrees that we require? Level of schooling? Are junior investigators or doctoral students eligible? Um, what about first-time grant applicants? So there are a number of questions asking about what are our criteria around who the principal investigator may be. Well, first off, a doctoral level degree is not required for this. So there's you know, a broad set of uh, possibilities here. The most important thing is that you got to be able to demonstrate the capacity to conduct the proposed research. So if you don't have the background in research or it's one that's building, not uh, fully mature yet, then consider building a team with oversight from a more seasoned researcher if necessary. Great. Thank you. We've also gotten a number of questions that I think I can respond to relatively quickly around um, the kind of the type of entity or organization. Do we consider applications from uh, rural settings, um, nonprofits versus universities? So, so again, absolutely, we will consider applicants from rural, urban, suburban, from the entire span, uh, all regions of the country as well. And we are particularly understanding, uh, interested in, in understanding 
how to improve health equity in those areas that really have uh, the worst health outcomes, and so particularly focusing on those parts of the country or those um, regional regional settings. Uh, we do encourage nonprofits to apply, and you'll notice in the application system that you can, as David mentioned, create a team of applicants. And so a university does not need to be the primary um, applicant organization. A nonprofit absolutely can serve in that role. So the next question that's coming in uh, is about um, whether this needs to be a new project or we could enhance existing programs. So Laura, can you speak a little bit to can this funding opportunity be used to extend or enhance currently existing programs that fit the criteria, or must projects associated with the call for proposals be completely new? Sure. Uh, the answer uh, is that they absolutely can be um, a portion, a portion of funding for a larger program, an existing program, uh, or a new program. Um, we actually encourage people to um, think about ways that they could use um, some research money to build on to something that they're already doing, or to add an evaluation, um, a new metric, or a new measure, or do a new set of analyses on an on an existing. Uh, on an existing project. So it definitely does not need to be brand new. It can be new, but it doesn't need to be new. Great. Thanks. So Nancy, we just got a question about uh, kind of how many, what our, what our proportion is of submissions to funding. So on average, what is the rate of acceptance of letters of intent and then full proposals? So how many letters of intent are we receiving? How many of those are invited to submit full proposals? And then how many full proposals do we anticipate funding? Oh, uh, that's a, a totally reasonable question. And we're still early enough in the process that I'm a little concerned about generalizing from our very first go-round, because I think you know we, we've been getting in a lot of letters of intent. And I think it's indicative partly of the uh, pent-up interest and, and uh, in this in this area, uh, it might be. So I, I I don't think we have enough uh, experience under our belt to really say. What we're trying to do is balance um, wanting more information about the projects with not wanting to burden people with doing a longer application if it if in, in the end they really don't have much of a chance of funding. So we're really looking for, uh, in the letters of intent, are they posing a, an important research question? Is it, is it one that can be clearly tested and will result in, in some outcome that will be uh, useful? And then, and so, you know, then the, obviously the, the devil's in the details, uh, which we would ask for more in the longer proposal. Uh, so uh, we're we're trying to keep that balance between not asking people to do a lot of extra work if, it, if, it, if we think that the probability is, is minimal to, to null, um, but also wanting to give people an opportunity to tell us more. So I, I'm not sure quite what the balance will be in the end, but my sense is that so far it's been, we've been uh, probably interested in about, in or giving it a high enough estimate that they are potentially fundable to about 20% of the letters of intent we're getting. But I would not take that as a hard figure that could change in the next two months. Sure, absolutely. And and just to reiterate your point, we, we have experienced significant interest and we've received numerous LOIs already in the first month and a half. Um, but to let people know there's, there's not a um, – an advantage to submitting earlier or later in the process. This is a truly rolling um, program for the next three years. David, maybe you can address the next question, which is about the types of methodologies that we're interested in, and, and do we encourage or do we consider participatory research methods? Mm. Good questions. Uh, we're open to a wide range of research methodologies. And that could include those that may be less frequently used in the health sector, but are respected in other fields. So, you know, economic modeling, for example. But it's important that you're able to assess health outcomes 
in your research, and therefore should consider methodologies for which this is feasible. Now, in terms of participatory research methods, yeah, those, those can be encouraged as long as your study is already well defined by the time you submit your proposal for funding. So for example there, if you're going through a participatory process of defining and prioritizing the research questions, you should complete that process before submitting your LOI. Great, thanks. So Nancy, the next question is, you've mentioned generalizability a few times. How does this fit within the program's desire to potentially assess issues of scalability or understand the influence of uh, different initiatives on the context of health and health behaviors? So how do you kind of translate between specificity and generalizability? So, you know, I, I think that the two, of the, the scalability and the generalizability are linked, and you really need both. I mean, you, one is, is this a program that really could be scalable, or is it so uh, tied to the particular conditions or resources in the place in which it's being developed and tested? And I think the other question with both scalability and generalizability is, will it, is is the issue one that is relevant to a significant enough group of people um, that by changing it, one can affect population health? You could affect population health in a very narrow group of people, you know, a, a very small group of people, which would be a very good thing to do, but won't necessarily overall change the, the, the status of overall population health of, of the larger population. However, that might still be fine if, it, in doing that, it reveals a mechanism or a process that could be picked up and used by others. So there's not a hard and fast rule about, uh, you know, what, what would be appropriate or not. What we are really asking for is a, the applicant to give us the rationale about why this, po why this population and this problem and this approach uh, will be helpful in understanding what can be done to, to improve population health and improve equity overall. Great, thank you. We've gotten a couple of, again, more logistical questions that I'll respond to now. One of, one of those is about will we accept more than one application from a given institution? Uh, can one person submit more than one proposal? And then uh, slightly a tangent, but I think related, is about uh, what is our stance on revise and resubmit, or does no mean no? So um, we do accept more than one application, certainly from a given institution, and even from one person. As we mentioned previously, we have received great interest in the program, and um, while it's not a hard and fast criteria, we certainly would like to have a diverse applicant pool. But again, our, our top priority is to fund the most uh, innovative um, research proposals that we think will really move the needle on population health and health equity. And so if it happens that one person is proposing the best research in those areas, we would consider it, absolutely. Um, as far as revise and resubmit, I would say, um, again, there's no official uh, official stance on you are not allowed to revise and resubmit. I, I guess I want to clarify a little bit. In some cases, we've received a letter of intent where the, the research question itself is not well articulated. And in those cases, I think it might be possible that you could submit you, you might be turned down at the letter of intent stage, and you might submit an application or a second LOI that really much better outlines the research questions, the approach, the design, et cetera. And in those cases, it would likely be appropriate. If you've done all of that initially in the LOI, in your first LOI attempt, if you've outlined the research questions, if you've provided a clear um, overview of your approach, and you received a turn down, it's likely that um, that a resubmission would not be successful. Again, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but uh, at that point we would probably encourage you to submit a new idea for a different research proposal um, if you have one. And um, 
and I'll just pause, I guess, to see if either Nancy or Tracy would like to add to that, that response. Yeah, I'll, I, I can add a little bit to it. We're given the number of letters of intent that we're getting. There's just no, no way we can give individual feedback uh, on the letters. Uh, I so in general, uh, in the what what you'll know is it, it's not being invited for a full proposal. Uh, we will be putting on the website some of the common reasons why why uh, proposals are not being uh, invited for 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 further consideration, and that may be helpful to you in, in figuring it out. I'd say every once in a while, if there's just an amazing question and there's a, you know, one, one issue that if it was resolved would give us a better sense of whether it would make sense to ask the applicant to go further, we, we might ask for clarification, but I think that's going to be the exception, way the exception rather than the rule. In general, it will either be to, to invite or, or, or not. But we hope that the um, the general feedback uh, about what some of the problems are will be helpful. Great, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna we're gonna get to a couple more questions. I know we're not gonna get to everybody's question today during the time that we have. So I want to take a moment to give a couple of um, suggestions for people whose questions that we didn't answer. I think we'll have some other mechanisms for you to engage with us that we'll talk about before the end of this webinar. Um, and also to say that I'm, I'm trying to prioritize in the number of questions we're getting, those questions that are probably uh, of interest to the most people. We've gotten numerous questions of the same topic or they seem to be about the process in general. I know we've gotten some very specific questions about whether or not a particular area or research of research is um, applicable, and, and we're not going to be able to answer all those questions today, but you are welcome to follow us up with us directly to ask about specific ideas for research if we aren't able to answer those questions on the webinar. Um, I, one question that I think is generally probably of interest to most people is, what does action-oriented mean? So we've said this is evidence for action and that research should be action-oriented. Can we describe what that means? Laura, do you want to give a first crack at that and then we can see if others want to add to your response? Sure. Um, so it's a good question. Um, I would say that the way we have thought about action-oriented research means that the work will lead to a change in research or practice in the culture of health field. So we're really asking investigators to consider the question of, will, is this a game changer for population health? Is this something that is going to lead to a tangible change in the way that we're approaching a problem uh, that, is, uh, that exists in this, in this field? Um, whatever, whatever the sort of chosen field is uh, that is related to culture of health. Great. Claire, or sorry, Tracy or, or Nancy, do you have anything to add to the action-oriented definition? I think Laura really captured it. Thank you, Laura. Great. Um, yeah. So, David, do you want to add? Well, no, I was just going back to um, uh, something that I said earlier, you know, if we take the example of disparities, there's quite a bit of research out there, you know, that says there are disparities. And so the point that we were trying to make there is what is it that we can do about that, right? And so it really is trying to look at more action-oriented. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's, that's a helpful um, clarification. So, um, one of the questions, and Tracy, that this might be a good one for you to think about from the foundation's perspective, is just can we give some examples of what cross-sector or multi-sector research or research teams would look like? What are some of those other sectors that we have been thinking about wanting to get, engage in this work? Sure. Um, you know, when we're thinking about building a culture of health, and as was described in examples, we're thinking of reaching out to sectors that are not typically thought of in the health space. So this might be folks in, um, in the built environment space, folks in transportation, um, folks in housing, as well as um, those uh, uh, economics and education, I should add in, as well as um, other types of health science research, such as psychology and sociology and um, 
behavior and those things as well. We're also, um, as we've described, looking not just for um, academic institutions, but you know, community organizations. We're looking for business leaders who may want to um, participate in a collaborative, um, as well as others in the community. Great, thank you. And I think you know that also speaks to a bit of a question that that Laura responded to earlier. I think particularly in fields where that have been outside the health sector, and we know that they're evaluating their work within their own sector. Um, if we can add on evaluation of health outcomes that are associated with that work, we see this, I think, as a great opportunity to try to gain that information about how work in other sectors, like you mentioned, economics or asset building, how, how is work in um, economic stability impacting people's health outcomes? That, that the, those are certainly interesting ideas to us. Um, so I think we're, we're getting close on time, and we have a few other things to share with you all. So I'm just going to take one last question, and then again, um, please visit our website to see the frequently asked questions, which we do update or contact us directly if you need to. Um, so the last question is, do, would we consider pilots or feasibility studies um, as applicable in this program? So Nancy, do you want to start with your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think we would consider pilots or feasibility if they are so clearly going to be tied to a health outcome. So to, show, to have a pilot, so for example, if there is something going on in transportation or labor or education and you want a pilot, is there some indication that that actually will have health effects? Uh, we would be very welcoming to an application uh, to fund that kind of pilot. We would be less excited about a pilot that just wants to develop an intervention that and that is presumed to have an effect on health, but you don't know, and, and the pilot won't actually get to that. So we would be less excited about a, a pilot that would develop a transportation intervention or policy or a labor policy uh, or a program without some tie to health. So uh, yes on development and, and piloting, but uh, it really needs to be in the context of showing some promise uh, and giving some at least initial indication that it will be related to a health outcome. Great. Thank you for that. And I will. I, there's one last question I saw that I think I can quickly respond to and then we can clarify later if needed. But it's basically a question about are we interested in process versus outcome? So measurement of characteristics of programs or policies, for example. And I think the answer to that really is, uh, it goes on to say, rather than the actual health indicators. I mean, I think the answer to that is we're, we're only interested in the process to the extent that we know it already works. So if for some reason we actually do have the evidence that says uh, this particular um, policy or program we know works. We know uh, Nancy's example earlier with smoking cessation, we know decreasing smoking leads to improved health. And so if there are then process-related measures uh, about um, that could, could drive action for other communities or other scalability um, implementation, et cetera, uh, that, was, that were, again, research-based, then at that point it might be interesting to us, but I think we've stressed along the way that we're first, we first want to make sure we know that it works and that, there are, that the, um, the work that is in being investigated it does lead to improved health outcomes. So that really is pushing our time for today, and there's a couple more things I want to share with you guys. So one is that um, please contact us, get in touch with us. Please, please visit the website. There is a myriad of information available there, um, frequently asked questions, the call for proposals itself, uh, more information about the culture of health. You can email us directly, um, and, we, and we will respond or give us a call. And we also are, um, are present on social media, both LinkedIn and Twitter. And again, the application itself, the process for application is on the Foundation's website, but all of the really relevant information and background that will help you to apply with a strong letter of intent is available on our website. Uh, to the point of our social media, um, and earlier when I mentioned that we will have an opportunity to answer other questions that maybe weren't responded to during this webinar, 
Next week on Friday, July 31st, we're going to host a live Twitter chat, um, Frequently Asked Question Friday. So we're going to chat under the hashtag e for a faq friday I know it's a long hashtag, but um, we thought that was the best way to tie to our work. Uh, or maybe it will be e for a faqs but for sure it will be on Friday, July 31st from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. Pacific. We will be live tweeting um, responses to our frequently asked questions and any questions that you might want to tweet to us. And certainly at any time you are welcome to tweet to us at Cohir, C-O-H-I-I-R. Uh, follow us on Twitter. We share a lot of information via that avenue and we'll respond to you if you send us questions in that way or join us for our live event next Friday. And just thank you all for joining us today, for participating in the webinar, and we look forward to reading your letters of intent. <laughs>